أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأسقط علينا كسفا من السماء إن كنت من الصادقين قال ربي أعلم بما تعملون فكذبوه فأخذهم عذاب يوم الذلة إنه كان عذاب يوم عظيم إن في ذلك لآية وما كان أكثرهم مؤمنين وإن ربك لهو العزيز الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Inshallah, we'll be starting by continuing with the same passage uh, about Shu'aib alayhi salam. And uh, we left off the conversation at ayah number 186. In ayah number 185, we saw that the people, they respond to Shu'aib alayhi salam. قَالُوا إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مِنَ الْمُسَحَّرِينَ They say that, you know, you are uh, demented, you are twisted. وَمَا أَنْتَ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُنَا وَإِنَّ ذُنُّكَ لَمِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ And they go on to say in ayah number 186 that and you are not but a human being just like the rest of us. I mean, you're just a regular person just like everyone else. وَإِنَّ ذُنُّكَ لَمِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ And as far as your claim, because even the prophets, as I had mentioned previously, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Even the prophets would inform the people that I am in fact a human being, like the rest of you, يُحَا إِلَيَّ With one very significant difference, and that is the fact that I received divine revelation. So they're responding to that second part of it by saying, وَإِنَّ ذُنُّكَ لَمِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ However, we are fully convinced of the fact that you are from those, from, from the liars. You are someone who is lying about all of this. In ayah number 187, they continue on, and this is that very um, egregious thing that we've seen previously as well. We saw this with the people of Thamud. They say, فَأَسْقِطَ عَلَيْنَا كِسَفًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِن كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ now there, this very interesting, very fascinating. I'll first explain just the language of the ayah, and then we'll talk about the concept here. So they say فَأَسْقِطَ which basically means to drop something. سَقَطَ يَسْقُطُ means to drop something. Alright? And so فَأَسْقِطَ rather more so سَقَطَ يَسْقُطُ means to fall. أَسْقَطَ يُسْقِطُ which is another form of the word. It means to drop something. So they're saying فَأَسْقِطَ makes a drop, drop something عَلَيْنَا upon us. So <clears throat> obviously they're not expecting Shu'aib alayhi salam physically, personally, individually to drop something upon them. But what they mean by that is you're the one who claims to be connected to this divine power. So now tell this divine power to make something fall upon us. Alright, as proof. And <clears throat> this is furthermore uh, more insolence and more uh, disrespect from these people towards Shu'aib alayhi salam. This is their way <clears throat> to call him out, so to speak, and to basically put him on the spot, and to try to prove him a liar in front of everyone. So they say, فَأَسْقِطَ alayna, Make it fall upon us. Now make what fall upon us? Kisafan. Now the word kisafan, um, it's been discussed in a lot of detail by many of the mufassirun. The word kisafan in, uh, in the Arabic language, Qita'atan, it means a portion of something, a part of something. And <clears throat> there's lots of different usages for this particular word that we see in the Arabic language um, in different situations, in different scenarios. For instance, the word kisafan um, in the Arabic language, they would use it for like a piece of cloth. Al-qita'atu min ash Imam Johar, he says, a piece or a part of something. They would say, kisfatan min thawbika. That if somebody had a shawl and they needed, they, they also, or somebody had a big uh, blanket or a huge, like a sheet, and somebody wanted a piece of cloth from that for themselves, so they would ask that person, A'atini kisfatan min thawbika. Do you mind cutting off a piece of that sheet and giving me a part, a piece of that cloth that you have? So that's what the word kisaf refers to. It means a part or a portion of something. 
So they're saying, فَأَسْقِتَ عَلَيْنَا كِسَفًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ Make just a small part of the sky fall upon us. Okay? And why do they not just say, even though we do see other places in the Qur'an, it does talk about the fact and the idea that, and we're gonna, I'm going to mention those ayat in just a moment, where other people have made the challenge that make the sky fall upon us. All right, make the sky fall upon us. Why are these people saying, make just a small part of the sky? Make just a small little portion fall upon us. Why, why, why are they saying a small portion? Why not the whole sky? So there's two explanations for that. Imam Razi rahimahullah ta'ala, he explains, you can understand that two ways. The first way to understand that is, that that shows the cowardice of the people, and it actually shows that there was some level of unsurety and paranoia on their part, that but what if all of this is true? So that's why even in their demand, they're like, oh yeah? Well, why don't you bring it on? At least some of it, right? Because then it kind of occurs to them. We see this when Walid bin Mughira goes to the Prophet wasallam and kind of challenges him. And when the Prophet wasallam starts reciting the ayat of Surah Fussilat, all right, and he becomes very, and the, uh, uh, the Prophet wasallam reaches the ayah about sa'iqa, the great punishment that will come and befall people. He becomes so overwhelmed that he reaches out and he puts his hand on the mouth of the Prophet and he says, please, I beg you, for the sake of relations, stop. So you see that there's like a lack of conviction in the position that they're even taking. And we see this in other instances as well. One time the Prophet ﷺ comes to the Haram, the Kaaba, and he comes to pray there. And while he's praying there, some of the you know, more, uh, you know, very rude uh, opposition to the Prophet ﷺ, some of them who just completely lacked any type of decency at all, they, you know, um, started kind of egging on you know, some people and said, you know, uh, who can do something really terrible to him? And so finally what happens is someone goes, a couple of people go and they bring back the innards of a camel. So outside the masjid, somebody must have, you know, sacrificed, slaughtered a camel. And so when they were walking in, they saw that some of the innards of the camel, like the stomach and stuff, was still kind of lying out there. Nobody had disposed of it yet. So they had seen it, so they finally, you know, put somebody up to, a couple of people, a couple of guys, and they go and they bring like the stomach and the intestines of that camel, and they come and they dump it onto the back of the Prophet so when he goes in sujood. And the Prophet wasallam, of course, he's kind of like pinned down underneath it, it's a camel, it's, so the, just the stomach and the intestines, it's huge. And the narration mentions that eventually one of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ, some narrations have mentioned Fatima, but according to some of the analysis by some of the scholars of the Sirah, they say Fatima would have been very young at that time, so maybe it was one of her older sisters, but Allah knows best. But either way, one of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ comes in and sees this, and then she goes and kind of like pushes it off his back. And the Prophet ﷺ gets up off the ground, and everyone's laughing and pointing and howling and you know how people act. And the, the Prophet has all that filth on his clothes. And so it was kind of one of those moments where somebody needed to be put in their place. The Prophet was a very, very kind, generous soul. But the Prophet was also a man of wisdom. And so that wisdom is sometimes recognizing when you need to discipline someone and when you need to be gentle with them. All right, and taking one position all the time is that lack of wisdom. So the Prophet ﷺ recognizing that this is kind of a moment, um, these people have crossed a particular type of line, and this is a moment where somebody needs to be put in their place. The Prophet ﷺ walked up to them, and he pointed at them, and he was just pointing at them, each one of them, and they were just kind of like weirded out. They were like, why is he pointing at us one by one? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِذِبْحِ that I was sent to take you guys out, right? And they were all just taken aback and all of a sudden some of them stand up and some of them are like, no, no, you can't talk like that. Don't say things like that. Why would you say things? And some of them even said, this man, everything that comes out of his mouth is always the truth, he never lies. Fine, we choose not to agree with him on this matter, but it's also scary when a guy that we cannot remember a single moment when he's ever lied, when he tells us, guess what? This isn't going to end well for y'all. 
So it really, you know, scared them. And we see ultimately one of the Sahaba, I believe it's Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he actually quite remarkably, he says, I was there on that day and I saw the people that the Prophet pointed to and all of them fell, all of them perished in the battle of Badr. Each and every single one of them. So the first analysis of why do they say only a part of the sky, make only a part of the sky fall on us, is because they themselves are a little afraid. So while they're being disrespectful, but at the same time they're kind of aware, but I, we're not so sure if we want to mess with him. The second interpretation, which is what the majority of the Mufassirun have taken from this, Ibn Kathir and Imam Al-Qurtubi concur with the second analysis, that they mentioned that the reason why they don't say make the whole sky fall on us, make the sky fall upon us, but they say make only a part of the sky fall upon us, is because within that they're, all, they're trying to basically be even more sarcastic. That listen, we don't want to ask too much of you, because we know you really can't do it. So how about we make it easier for you? We're not gonna ask you to tell, we're not gonna ask you to make the whole sky fall on us. How about you just make a small little part of the sky fall on us? How about that? That sounds easy, right? Why don't you go ahead and do that? And so there's that disrespect. And so they're being sarcastic, they're trying to mock and ridicule. Shu'aib alayhi salam. So that's where they say, فَأَسْقِتَ عَلَيْنَا كِسَفًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِن كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ And then they conclude that, that demand, if you will, or that, that, that mockery by saying, in kunta mina sadiqin. If you are truthful. If. And that's a huge if. Like that's what they're trying to say. They're saying it's a huge if, but if you're actually truthful, just make a small little part of the sky follow us. Now, the, the topic here particularly is about, you know, this level of disbelief and this level of istihza. As the Quran calls it. مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَحْزِئُونَ Every single time a messenger comes to them, they just mock them. Okay, this is that level of mockery and disrespect and insolence that is, you know, of the furthest type. Of the furthest type. And this is something that we saw in the story of Thamud. And we also see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions other places. And this is also something that the Prophet ﷺ, very tragically and unfortunately, this is something that the Prophet ﷺ also had to deal with. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعًا they said that we will not believe in you. The Quraysh said to the Prophet ﷺ, we will not believe in you until you are able to sprout forth from the earth a spring for us. Like we walk out to the middle of the desert where there's no water at all, and we just point to a place on the ground, and then you're able to just make a spring come ripping out of the earth from there, then we can talk about this. And then they go on, Allah mentions, O tusqita sama'a, or you make the sky fall upon us. And they also use that same word. Or okay, at least just as you claim, or as you claim, just make a small little part, teeny little small part of the sky fall upon us. Or, or what else can you do? What, you go, what else, something else that you can do is that you bring God Himself and this is how disrespectful they're being now. Like physically bring God and a bunch of angels with you to come, to come meet us physically, to come hang out with us. And then we'll talk about it. Then maybe we can believe. Okay? So the, they made these demands of the Prophet ﷺ. In another place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that they also said to the Prophet ﷺ, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُمَّ وَإِذْ قَالُوا Remember the time when they said, Allahumma. They said, Allahumma. But they didn't say Allahumma like we do, right? Where we're making dua, they said it to mock. Allahumma. That's, that's what you guys say, right? Like if somebody was trying to mock, they say, Allahumma. Isn't that what you guys say? Right? Right? Allahumma. In kana hadha huwa al haqq min indika. How about this? How about we pray to your God? They said to the Prophet, ﷺ, may Allah protect us all from such you know, disbelief. But they said to the Prophet, ﷺ, how about we pray to your God? Allahumma, in kana hadha huwa al-haqqu min indika, that if this is actually a truth that you have sent down, this, they're pointing at the Prophet and calling him a, a this. If this, 
All this, this business right here, all this Muhammad, Quran, Islam business, if this is actually truth that you have sent down, فَأَمْطِرْ عَلِيْنَا حِجَارَةً مِنَ sama. Then make stones rain down from the sky upon us. أَوِئْتِنَا بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Or just bring any type of painful punishment. How about that? We won't be specific. Just bring a painful punishment and that's how you can prove that you're not lying to us. Such insolence and disrespect. Such insolence and disrespect. And many of the scholars and the mufassirun, particularly the philosophers amongst them, they've discussed this at length, that you see a pattern within the Qur'an, that whenever there were a people who crossed that particular line, where they reached a point of mockery, where they walked up to the prophets and messengers, and they said, you know what, just bring this punishment home, just bring it right now, come on. We're tired of hearing about it, we're tired of talking about it, just bring it, you just prove it, okay? So whenever they crossed that particular line, then the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was inevitable was inevitable, because they crossed that line. But we just talked about the fact, and Allah quotes it in the Qur'an as well, that the Quraysh did the same. But we see that that did not come upon the Quraysh. Actually, some scholars say that a lesser form of it did come upon the Quraysh. That's what they, used to, that's what they would refer to the Battle of Badr as. They didn't see the Battle of Badr as just like this match of wits and we were victorious and we overcame them and we defeated them. They said, no, no. Sahaba were humble people. They were humble people. They said this was God's victory. But many of them used to talk about the Battle of Badr that that was that you know, final conclusion that came because everyone who had said those types of things to the Prophet all perished in Badr. So it's interesting. But as far as just like a total annihilation of the people, they ex- why didn't that happen? Because the explanation of that is provided within the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ That God will not, God promises, He will not destroy them, annihilate them, wipe them out, so long as you are amongst them. Allah will not do that. And what about after the Prophet ﷺ? What about the time after the Prophet ﷺ? That was a dua of the Prophet ﷺ. Where he made this dua, he made this supplication. And he said, Oh Allah, the, my people, the ummah. Now the ummah is of two types, right? We, we, the, this is something the scholars talk about. There's ummah to da'wah and ummah to ijabah. That there is the ummah that is being called to Allah. And that is all of humanity after the Prophet ﷺ. And then there's Ummatul Ijaba. Muslims are those who have answered that call, who have believed in the message. But everyone, in a sense, is an Ummati of the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone is someone the Prophet ﷺ was concerned about. Well, the Prophet ﷺ made a particular dua, it's an authentic narration, where he made a dua where he asked Allah that, oh Allah, do not allow my Ummah to be completely wiped out. Do not wipe them all out. Yes. There might be some, tragically, who will be disrespectful, who will disbelieve, who will challenge, who will mock. But please do not just annihilate and destroy my people in like one great punishment. And that was a dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet ﷺ that he answered that dua. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet ﷺ that till the day of judgment, the day of resurrection, that will not happen to the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. So the only reason why that did not befall everyone at that time or afterwards is because of the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ, the love, the compassion that the Prophet ﷺ had for humanity, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering the dua of His beloved Messenger ﷺ. It's very, very powerful. So they say here, <clears throat> فَأَسْقِطَ عَلَيْنَا كِسَفًا مِنَ السَّمَائِ إِن كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ Make a part of the sky fall upon us if you are actually telling the truth. So Shu'aib in ayah number 188, he responds to them. Qala, Shu'aib alayhi salam said, Qala, Rabbi a'lamu bima ta'amaloon. Rabbi a'lam. My Lord and my Master, He is more knowing of what, what actions you people do. We understand what that means. This is a very straightforward point. That my Lord, my Master, God, Allah, He knows what you're doing. Okay, he knows what you're doing. But what does that mean here? How does that fit into the messaging here? And the way that it's explained, 
For instance, uh, Ibn Kathir rahmallahu ta'ala, he says, يَقُولُوا Allahu أَعْلَمُ بِكُمْ فَإِن كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَحِقُونَهُ فَإِن كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَحِقُونَ ذَلِكَ جَازَاكُمْ بِهِ غَيْرَ ظَالِمٍ لَكُمْ وَكَذَلِكَ وَقَعَ بِهِمْ كَمَا سَأَلُوهُ جَزَاءً وِفَاقًا Alright? So he says that the, what that means, Rabbi A'lamu bima ta'amalun, you're asking for the punishment to be brought upon you? Listen, Shu'aib alayhi salam saying something very powerful that we can learn a lot from. This is a prophet of God, somebody who receives divine revelation. But listen to what he's saying and how he's saying it. What he's saying is that I do not make that call. I don't decide when you'll be destroyed, or if you will or you won't. I don't decide that. That's not my decision. Nor is it your decision. Nobody decides for someone else when they die, when they're destroyed, none of that. Rabbi, a'lamu bima That is God's decision. That is Allah's decision. And my Lord is very, very all, He is all-knowing, very well-informed and knowledgeable about everything that you people do. So in fact, if you do deserve to be destroyed, then He knows that and He'll take care of it. If you don't deserve to be destroyed, then that's His judgment. And we see that, and we talked about it um, in the class previously, but one of the very powerful ayats of the Qur'an is when the Prophet wasallam in the aftermath of the battle of Uhud, when he's sitting there wiping blood from his face, wondering how many of his companions, his beloved friends have fallen, that the Prophet is just overcome by this emotion and this frustration. And the Prophet says, لَن يُفْلِحَ قَوْمٌ وَشَجُّ وَجَنَبِيٍ These people who have done this to the face of their Prophet, how can such a people ever succeed? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah to the Qur'an, uh, revealed the ayah of the Qur'an to the Prophet لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ This is not your decision to make. O يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ Maybe God will forgive them. O يُعَذِّبَهُمْ Maybe He will punish them. فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ What they did is wrong. What they have done is wrong. But whether Allah punishes them or Allah forgives them, that is not your decision. That is not anyone's decision. That is solely the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's something very, very powerful that's being stated here. رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُوا My Lord knows best أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَعْلَمُ بِأَعْمَالِكُمْ وَبِمَا تُسْتَوْجِبُونَ عَلَيْهَا مِنَ الْعِقَابِ فَإِنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُعَاقِبَكُمْ بِإِسْقَاطِ كِسِفٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَعَلَى وَإِنْ أَرَادَ عِقَابٍ آخَرَ فَإِلَيْهِ الْحُكْمُ وَالْمَشِيئَةِ Another very interesting point that Imam Razi makes is that what he's also saying here is that look, if you ultimately do deserve punishment from God, punishment will come on you. But you don't even get to dictate what type of punishment that you're going to get. So he's actually humbling them. He's humbling himself by saying, I have no say in this matter. You're telling me to call the punishment, I, I don't have a say in this matter. I make dua, I ask Allah, I beseech God. I don't decide anything. He's humbling himself, but he's also humbling them. He's also saying, by the way, if you do actually deserve punishment, you do get the fact and the idea, you don't get to dictate to God how He destroys you. He'll do whatever He wants to do to you. So this very, very powerful statement. Rabbi a'lamu bima ta'amaloon. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَكَذَّبُوهُ فَأَخَذَهُمْ عَذَابُ يَوْمِ الذُّلَّةِ They rejected him. They rejected him. They called him a liar. فَأَخَذَهُمْ So the عَذَابُ يَوْمِ الذُّلَّةِ The day of the shade, the punishment of the day of the shade took them. Very interesting connection, uh, uh, construction. فَأَخَذَهُمْ They were taken. Okay? Something came upon them. What came upon them? Adabu, the punishment. Yom, the, day, the punishment of the day of. Adhullah. Now the word dhulla from dhill refers to a shade. Like the shade of a tree. Alright? We see that word in the famous hadith. Yom la dhilla illa dhillu. Sab'atun yudhilluhum allahu fi dhillihi. Yom la dhilla illa dhilluhu. Seven people that God will grant them a place under His shade on the day that there will be no shade other than His shade. That's our word dhullah. Alright? 
So what's meant by the punishment of the day of the shade? What does that mean? What does that refer to? Before we get into the detail uh, and, and kind of understanding and designating exactly what that's speaking about, there's a very interesting um, observation. There's a very interesting observation. And that observation is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a couple of different um, ways in which the people of Shu'aib alayhi salam, that in the way that they were destroyed. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a couple of different things. One of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran is that In one place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In one place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَخَذَتِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا الصَّيْحَةَ وَأَخَذَ This is in Surah Hud. In Surah Hud, Surah number 11, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the story about the people of Shu'aib alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how are they destroyed? وَأَخَذَتِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا الصَّيْحَةً That the thing that took them was allowed... Now I told you the word linguistically, sayha can refer to a scream, but also it can be used a little bit more figuratively to refer to a blast. Okay? That there was some type of a scream or some type of a blast, and that is what did them in. That's one thing. Another thing that is mentioned in the Qur'an is the fact that the earth shook. فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الرَّجِفَةُ فَأَصْبَحُوا فِي دَارِهِمْ جَاثِمِينَ كَأَلْ لَمْ يَغْنَوْ فِيهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to الرَّجَفَةُ that the earth shook beneath their feet. That's number two. Number three here, it's talking about يَوْمِ الذُّلَّةُ It's talking about the fact that there was some shade involved. Now, what does that mean? How do we understand that? That it almost sounds like, again, if you take it very kind of on the surface superficially, then it, it's not clear exactly how these people were destroyed, how they were punished. Just in terms of reconciling the different passages in the Quran. And in Surah Al Ahqaf, there's kind of a summary of all of it. In Surah Al-Ahqaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they saw something approaching towards them, clouds, they saw clouds approaching towards them. And when they saw these clouds, then they said, these look like clouds that will bring rain to us. But they were hasty in assuming that there was rain being brought to them in these clouds, but there was actually a wind in which there was a very terrible punishment, and it ended up annihilating and destroying all of them. And you saw nothing was remaining of them except for their homes. But the people were all gone. Okay? That's also another place. So when you reconcile all of this, how, how do we go about in doing so? So the Mufassirun and the scholars have some explanations, but at the same time what we also have is some narrations from Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We have some narrations from him which provide those explanations and reconcile all these different passages. So I'll share one of those particular narrations from Abdullah bin Abbas. He says, Inna Allah ta'ala fataha alayhim baba min abwabi jahannam. That the way that they were destroyed was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up very ever so slightly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up one of the doors of hell upon them. What it did was, wa arsala alayhim haddatan wa harran shadidan. فَأَخَذَ بِأَنفَاسِهِمْ What that means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent such a severe heat. Sent such, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent such severe weather, such severe heat upon them, that people were starting to feel like they could not breathe, like they were suffocating. When that happened, water, staying indoors, None of that seemed to be helping. So they finally came to the conclusion that let's maybe leave here, let's go outside of the city, 
Let's try to go into the forest. Remember we talked about the outskirts of a forest. Let's go into the forest and maybe it'll be a little bit more temperate there. It'll be a little bit more tolerable there. So they go out into the forest area. When they go out there, the narration mentions that what initially happened is the, they were kind of spread out into the forest just trying to find spots or see if it was a little bit more comfortable. And then the earth shook. When the earth started to shake, when they felt like some tremors, like there was an earthquake, they all came kind of like running together. When they all came into one particular place, their clouds started to appear over them. Clouds started to appear over them. And like they felt for a moment, they felt a little relief from the heat. They felt some relief from the heat. It was like a little bit of a cool breeze. It seemed to kind of cool down a little bit. And so people started relaxing a little bit. And people started kind of gathering even more and kind of congregating there, sitting down underneath that cloud. Once the clouds had fully assembled, and now they expected that this looks like it's going to rain and we're finally going to break the drought. Then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. He mentions in the narration that, أَلْهَبَهَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَلَيْهِمْ نَارًا that then from those same clouds, fire came raining down out of those clouds. Fire came down from out of those clouds. And the narration mentions, كَمَا يَحْتَرِقُ الْجَرَّادُ فِي الْمَقْلَى And he says that they were completely incinerated. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ahqaf, فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ If you would have passed through there the following day, you would have just seen like a, it would have seemed strange. Like almost like if it was like, like, a, like a fake village or a town, like a, like a movie set. It would just be homes and marketplaces and streets. Like it would seem like people could live here. But you would not find a single soul in sight. And it wasn't even that you would find their dead bodies strewn all around or you'd have some explanation. No, because they went out into the forest and there Allah sent this fire and they were completely incinerated and nothing was left of them. So this is that narration of Abdullah bin Abbas that kind of summarizes the three, four different places in the Qur'an. One place Allah says an earthquake, one place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, there was a loud blast and that fire raining down from the cloud that can be symbolic of that blast. The earthquake we talked about, the fact that there was a shade that led to their destruction. So you, when you read this narration, you see that it's actually all of them reconcile. And that it's not the fact that the different passages of the Qur'an, billah. We know it's an impossibility. Nevertheless, just for the sake of discussion, we know that obviously they're not contradicting one another. All right, But rather, those are just different elements and different parts of the story. And in fact, in fact... Maybe the most amazing thing, one of the most amazing things that you see here, Imam Razi rahimullahu ta'ala, he mentions this. He says that one of the most remarkable things that you um, see here is that <clears throat> there is one follow-up question that we haven't answered yet. And that one follow-up question is, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention certain types of punishment in certain passages. Does everyone understand the question? Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their punishment, their destruction involved these three, four different elements. It had three, four different parts to it, the entire sequence. We understand that. And those different parts of that sequence are mentioned at different places within the Qur'an. But the question is, that why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the parts or the portions that He mentions in different places? Why does He mention them there? What significance, what relevance do those particular um, things have to the place where they're being mentioned? And so one of the very interesting, one of the very fascinating explanations that's provided of that is the fact that
Yes. Yes, sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure I was able to find the actual um, mention of it. And this is actually mentioned by Ibn Kathir, rahmahullah ta'ala. I didn't want to misquote him, so I wanted to find the exact passage. This is mentioned by Ibn Kathir, rahmahullah ta'ala. So he says, وَقَدْ ذَكْرَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ صِفَةَ إِلَاكِهِمْ فِي ثَلَاثِ مَوَاطِنِ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about how they were destroyed in three different places, mentioning three different elements of their eventual annihilation. So he says the, 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 the beauty, the, the, the eloquence of the Qur'an is what part of their punishment does Allah mention in each specific place. So he says, number one, in Surah Al-A'raf, number one, in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَكَرَ أَنَّهُ أَخَذَتْهُمُ الرَّجَفَ فَأَصْبَحُ فِي دَارِهِمْ جَاثِمِينَ Allah mentions that there was an earthquake that overtook them and then they were just kind of like left and they were destroyed. وَذَلِكَ لِيَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لَنُخْرِجَنَّكَ يَا شُعَيْبُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَكَ مِنْ قَرِيَتِنَا أَوْ لَتَعُودُنَّ فِي مِلَّتِنَا فَأَرْجَفُوا بِنَبِيِّ اللَّهِ وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَهُ فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الرَّجَفَ Because in Surah A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that they threatened, they threatened the well-being of the Prophet Shu'aib and they basically, what we would say in English, what a good translation of it would be, that we will remove the earth from beneath your feet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we made the earth shake under their feet. Number two, in Surah Hud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَخَذَتِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا الصَّيْحَةِ that there was a loud blast or a scream, like a loud blast that did them in. And the reason why that particular punishment, that part of the punishment is mentioned there, because in Surah Hud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, they said to Shu'ayb alayhi salam, أَصَلَاتُكَ تَأْمُرُكَ أَن نَتْرُكَ مَا يَعْبُدُ آبَاؤُنَا أَوْ أَن نَفْعَلَ فِي أَمْوَالِنَا مَا نَشَاءَ إِنَّكَ لَأَنْتَ الْحَلِيمُ الرَّشِيدُ Surah Hud particularly talks about the fact that they excessively mocked Shu'ayb alayhi salam. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They would publicly ridicule him. They would make a public spectacle of them. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions like a huge blast taking them all out at once. They made a lot of noise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made such a noise that it killed them all. And then number three, we're looking at it right here in, um, in, surat, um, in Surah Al-Shu'ara. Allah says, فَأَسْقِتَ عَلَيْنَا كِسَفًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِن كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ They said, just make a small little part of the sky fall on us. Not a whole lot. We won't ask you to do too much. We just want you to make a little small tiny part of the sky fall on us. Can you do that much? Can you do that much? So that's why the part of the punishment Allah mentions here, فَأَخَذَهُمْ عَذَابُ يَوْمِ الذُلَّةِ It was a punishment of the day of the shade. They, they, they tried to mock and challenge the messenger by saying, make the sky fall on us? Well, the sky did rain down fire upon them. And it incinerated them. It destroyed them and annihilated them to the point where they, even their remnants, their, their bodies, their bones were not allowed to remain on the earth. May Allah protect us all. So this is kind of the eloquence and the beauty of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this. And the lesson within that, the lesson within that, is the fact that this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends the honor of His Prophets and His Messengers. Alayhim as-salatu wa taslim. So, moving forward now, فَأَخَذَهُمْ عَذَابُ يَوْمِ ذُلَّةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ That that was the punishment of a great day. 
That was a punishment of a very overwhelming day. And we talked about this by calling the day on which the punishment happened overwhelming or great. You're automatically saying that the punishment was also overwhelming and great. Okay? Number two, the second thing, because that particular description is given here, this was the punishment of a great day. Um, one of the students of Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Mujahid, rahimallahu ta'ala, he actually says that that was maybe the worst punishment that, you know, because of all the different stages and the levels of it and how, you know, uh, thorough and, you know, complex it was, that was maybe the worst punishment, the worst day of punishment that's ever come upon this earth. And in the next ayah, ayah number 190, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fi dhalika la ayah, that most definitely in that, in what was mentioned here above, there's a very, very powerful lesson, a huge reflection. وَمَا كَانَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Even though most of them just will not believe. In spite of all of this. وَإِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَكُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ And most definitely, without a shred of a doubt, your Lord, he has always been and will always be dominant. Nobody can overcome his will. And Ar-Rahim. And very, very merciful. Constantly merciful. Always granting a second chance and a second opportunity. We just have to seize it. So this concludes the passage about Shuaib alayhi salam. And with the conclusion of the passage of Shuaib alayhi salam, this also closes off the whole middle section of the surah. Remember we had talked about the fact that essentially the surah is divided into three major sections. You had the introduction, you had the whole middle of the surah which is the argument and then you have the conclusion. The middle of the surah, the argument, that had many many passages within it. That had many passages within it. It's talking about, speaking about a number of different prophets. And we went through all of their stories where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions to us the stories of seven different messengers. Musa, Ibrahim, Nuh, Hud, Salih, Lut, and Shu'aib alayhi salam. Seven different prophets. And so that constructs the middle of the surah, the bulk of the surah, which is also kind of the argument that is being made and all the lessons that are being imparted there. This concludes, this wraps up that whole big middle section of the surah. Alright? And what we're going to be embarking upon, inshallah, is the conclusion of the surah. وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنْزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ From there, ayah number 192 till the end of the surah, 227, that will be the conclusion of the surah. And I'll talk more about what that talks about when we actually begin that particular passage. What I wanted to talk about here is at the conclusion of this particular section and the seven different passages within this larger section, there's some very um, important observations that have to be made about what we've studied. Particularly whenever you go through <clears throat> something that is very lengthy, what can end up happening is, of course, you know, the Qur'an is to be studied, and we have to study the Qur'an in its entirety. But, having said that, there are different challenges in different portions of the Qur'an that you have to take into consideration. What I mean by challenges are there are different considerations you have to have. When you study the small short surahs, right, you, understand, you have the entirety of that course. Because I, I had mentioned this previously, that Imam Suyuti rahimahullahu ta'ala, he basically tells us that each and every single surah is like a course unto itself. Alright, they're all like independent courses, 114 courses in your entire Qur'anic education. Alright, this curriculum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. So when you do, when you study some of the shorter surahs, the, the, the benefit obviously there is you have the whole course right there in front of you. It's a very doable course. You can basically sit down and do it. You can do it in one sit down. Okay? You sit down once, knock out the whole course. And there's something about that, right? Because when you get it all done at one time, then it's very cohesive. But there's a consideration there. The consideration there is, in terms of it being so short, but still talking about such a huge subject matter, wal asri, talking about salvation of humanity, or surat al-feel, talking about one of the most 
you know, miraculous and huge events in human history. Or you have something like Surah Al-Ikhlas, which is a summary of all of our aqeedah and belief in God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you have Ida Ja'a Nasrullahi Wal Fatih that talks about kind of the, uh, the philosophy and the psychology of being at the end of your journey. Right? You have so, these are very huge, powerful ideas. So what ends up happening is that they're short. They're short. They're right there. You can sit down once and knock it all out. But there's a consideration. The consideration there is because of its brevity, you don't get a lot of context. You don't get a lot of context. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al It doesn't give you that whole backstory that you know we hear every single time. It's not giving that to you here. It's not bothering with that. It gets straight to the point. Do you see what happened to them? Alam yaj'al kaydun fi tadlil. They had a plan. What was their plan? Allah says not worthy, not, not worth mentioning here. Just note that their plan was completely ruined. It just gets straight to the point. You don't get all that context and background information. So you know that's a consideration there, and you have to kind of take that into consideration. And it's something that you know the educator and the student basically have to be aware of, and they have to address that. When you study longer surahs of the Quran, one of the benefits there is you get a lot more context. You get a lot more context. Instead of just saying, and there are some places in the Quran where it just summarizes, where it'll say, um, Hud, Salih, Lut, Shu'aib came to their people, they didn't listen, they were all destroyed. There's places in the Quran where it just says that much. Okay, that's it, that's all you're getting. But then over here, when you read through a surah like Surah Al-Shu'ara, you get a lot more context. There's a lot more to study, there's a lot more to learn, there's a lot more to discuss, there's a lot more to dive into. You see whole conversations playing out. Shaib alayhi salam said this, then the people said that, then he said this, then the people said that. Then finally, this is how the punishment from God came. So you get a lot more context there. That's the benefit of that type of study. But the consideration, the thing that you have to be aware of, that you have to be mindful of is the fact that the thing you have to be mindful of there is the fact that because it's so lengthy, 227 ayat, it spans over or near half a juz. So we've been studying it now for 20 some odd days. So what ends up happening is that over time it can start to become a little disjointed. It can start to kind of you know, in your head at least, fall apart. It can become a little disjointed. Okay? It's difficult to remember where the passage about Shu'aib Ali Salam even started because it took us three days to get through the passage. Let alone where the beginning of the surah was. So that's a particular challenge. That's, that's a particular consideration. And that's something that we will take into consideration. And we w- that's why I wanted to dedicate kind of the last few minutes we have here today to talking about what we take away from this whole middle section of the surah that went through the mention of seven different prophets. And the other thing that we'll do is when we reach the conclusion in the next session when we begin the concluding passage of the surah, I will because the concluding passage ties in so closely with the introduction of the surah, we'll kind of review and rehash, we'll review and rehash some of the key themes of the beginning of the beginning, the introduction of the surah. We'll rehash some of that. And lastly and finally, what we always try to do here, because in all the previous Quran intensives, we go through a pretty lengthy surah, surah Maryam, surah Taha, so on and so forth. Um, so what we always do is on the final day that we have together here in the tafsir dars, we actually kind of go through a running translation of the entirety of the surah. Just so that you're able to see it kind of all come together into one cohesive you know, discussion, one cohesive address. Inshallah. So, what I wanted to mention here is, we have just gone through, we've just read through this um, middle section of the surah that goes through the mention of seven different prophets, as we just mentioned. And what this basically talks about, one of the things, is وَقَدْ مَضَى هَذَا الْمَوْكَبَ عَلَى سُنَّةٍ لِلَّهِ ثَابِتَةٍ لا تتخلف. One of the primary themes of this entire section is the fact that there, God 
has a tradition. What that means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a system. When people lose their way, Allah sends them someone to very compassionately and mercifully, you know, deliver a message to them. In a very dignified, compassionate way, God sends someone to bring them the message. When they reject that message, when they oppose that message, then, and they start to cross all types of lines, then there is the wrath that comes from Allah. The wrath comes from God. And so this particular past, this, this issue has been brought up repeatedly in seven different forms in this whole middle section of the surah. And this is all now substantiating that consolation that was provided to the Prophet ﷺ in the beginning, in the introduction of the surah, that God is not unaware of what they're saying and what they're doing to you. Allah is fully aware. And they will be made to answer for what they're doing. And how they're behaving and how they're acting. They will answer. And when, you know, if somebody kind of tells you, I'll take care of it. A lot of times, if you're really bothered by something, you're really concerned about something, what do you say? What do you think at least? Okay, you might not say it, but what do you, what do you sometimes, if you're really bothered by something, you're really worried about something, what do you at least think to yourself? Is he just brushing me off? Is he just telling me? No, I'll take care of it, I'll take care of it. Is he actually going to take care of it? How do I know he's going to take care of it? How is he going to take care of it? What's he going to do? Right? There's just, it's just part of that human you know, anxiety. It's part of being a human being. Having that level of anxiety. Particularly if something weighs very heavily upon you. And we already saw, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ نَفْسَكَ أَلَّا يَكُونُ مُؤْمِنِينَ it was killing the Prophet ﷺ that these people would not listen. They would not believe. They would not come around. Not that the Prophet ﷺ had any doubt at all, but it's just that human anxiety. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in seven different stories, seven different ways, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the Prophet ﷺ, more so even for us. More than the Prophet ﷺ, it's for us. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows to us and demonstrates to us, look Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dealt with this in the past, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word is solid. In Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. God does not break His promises. God keeps His word. So don't worry, rest assured. There's a very powerful theme here in this section. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, he, in, this, in this particular sec, section, we saw that in all seven narratives, all seven stories, they all concluded by saying what? In fi dhalika la ayah. In fi dhalika la ayah. That there most definitely is a huge sign in this, in this story. There's something to really think about, take notice of. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions at the conclusion of Surah Hud. This is almost like a different way to present that same idea. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةٌ There is a sign, there is a reflection, think about it. Think about it, reflect upon it. Another way that Allah presents that same idea is in another surah of the Qur'an where Allah also mentions numerous prophets and their experiences. And that is in surah Hud, surah number 11. And at the conclusion of surah Hud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ That in their stories is an ibrah. Ibrah. There's an ibrah for people of thought for people of intellect, for people who have the ability to think and understand things. Intelligent people, smart people, bright people. There's an ibra in their stories. Now, I, I haven't translated the word ibra. What does the word ibra mean? Roughly translated, lesson. But again, there's something more there. What's very fascinating about the word ibra is that ibru sabi. Like we see in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ أَوْ عَابٍ سَبِيلٍ عَابٍ And even in the Qur'an, إِلَّا عَابِرِ سَبِيلٍ حَتَّى تَغْتَسِلُوا Okay? The word عَابِر is used. The word عَابِر there is used in the meaning of crossing over. It means to cross over from one side to the other side. 
The verse in the Quran talks about the fact that you, if you are in a state of major impurity, where you need to take a bath of purification. And so the Quran is saying that don't enter into the mosque in that particular state, take a shower, and then come into the mosque. All right? Respect the sanctity of Allah's house. It says, Illa abidi sabilin, unless you have to pass through there to get to the shower. Unless you have to pass through there to get to the shower. Okay? So, again, crossing over from one side to the other side. Okay? When the Prophet ﷺ uses, when he uses the same word where he says, be in the world like a stranger or like somebody who's passing through. Which means that the world should be like a bridge. From crossing over from the, from, from the dunya to the akhirah. From your birth to your death. From coming from the realm of the unseen and going back to the realm of the unseen and just as the bridge in between. That that's how you should live in the world. So it's the meaning of crossing over. Now why is that so powerful? The word for taking lessons, reflecting upon the stories of prophets and messengers in the Quran is referred to as Ibra. Ibra. Which means that this should cause a fundamental shift in your perspective in your paradigm, in your understanding. This has to cause a significant change in how you see things, how you understand things, how you choose to live your life. It's got to change. You have to cross over from jahala to ilm, from kufr to iman, from nifaq to sidq. There has to be some type of shift and change. From heedlessness, Ghafla to taqwa, God consciousness. There has to be a shift by reading all this, by studying all this, by reflecting upon all of this. Because if there's not, then what, what was really the point of it? As we established in the very beginning, because this is a surah that heavily relies upon stories, we talked about this in the very beginning. That there might be lots of stories out there that are for our entertainment and things like that, but the stories of the Qur'an are not there for entertainment. The life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah, is not there for entertainment purposes. It's for it to cause a change in our lives and to make us think and change the way that we live our lives. And so hopefully that's something that we're able to do. Think back on all the passages we've read through, the experiences of Musa ﷺ, dealing with the arrogance of Fir'aun, Overcoming all the different, you know, obstructions and challenges that were in his way. Even when death completely surrounded them, he never lost hope, he never lost faith. In the Rabbi. Ibrahim alayhi salam. That the people closest to him and around him, not believing and challenging his faith and pushing back and threatening him. But how he never lost his convictions, his hope. He knew who he was, he knew what he believed. In all the tests and trials that he overcame. Nuh alayhi salam. Where he dealt with not only just very stubborn people, but even dealt with such a tragic loss so close to him. But once again, remained humble before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't allow that to jade him. Everything, 950 years of people ignoring you, ridiculing you, mocking you, and to never lose your character. To never become jaded. It's remarkable. Hud alayhi salam. Where we see him dealing with such arrogant people, powerful people. And how arrogance and power corrupts. And we have to think about those same dynamics within our life. Influence, power. How does it corrupt us? What type of influence is it, is, it, is it having on me? And what kind of effect does it have on me? We saw with Salih alayhi salam. How opulence, comfort, luxury, spoils and rots the hearts and the minds. And we can really think about ourselves in light of that. Lut alayhi salam. Where even when certain things that God has forbidden, social evils, 
become so pervasive, when they become the standard and the norm, how faith still requires you to hold firmly to your principles and to live a life of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter if the whole world is living their lives otherwise. I have a code that I live by. When Shu'aib alayhi salam, when corruption enters into quote unquote other areas of our lives, and we try to separate between things and say that, no, 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 that, that's completely different. This difference between personal and professional. Personal and professional. And a reminder about the fact that, no, 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 you are one human being. And all of your actions can be traced back to the condition of your heart. Your personal conduct and your professional conduct. It all goes back to the condition of your heart. All these powerful lessons. We have to read through them. We have to think about them. We're not done. We're not done. We're never done with the study of the Qur'an. It's not that, and this is more of something I want to say at the end of the surah, but I'll say it here. When we finish surah to shu'ara, we're not done. But we got to go back and read it again and reflect upon it again. And it needs to cause a change within our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Qur'an the spring of our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Qur'an a guiding force within our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Qur'an a means of change in how we live our lives. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Qur'an a means of our salvation in this life and in the next. Ameen. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nasaqfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.